Ohio Gozaimasu, YouTube. I am Sato Sayuri, and since I'm one of the few people on staff without some sort of regular project now, they all got together and decided that I needed some camera time. As I've a bent for history, I drew the series that has the most to gain from looking into the origins of some of the delusions that the world's population holds dear. If my English isn't the best ever, or I butcher some words, then I apologize now, English isn't my first language, and although I'm getting fairly good at thinking in it, I'm still prone to making errors. Kage is helping me write these scripts, so the grammar should be okay. Just try not to roast me too badly for the occasional mistake. I have a number of topics at my disposal, and over the next year or three I'll get to most of them. I say most, because there are some excellent approaches to a couple of them taken by others, and far be it from me to step on toes. Cool Hard Logic will forgive me for my coverage of today's topic, the closely related pseudosciences of homeopathy and naturopathy. Kage secured permission to adopt some clips from his lovely testing homeopathy series some time ago and that more than anything else made the decision to tackle this area first. As a matter of history, both of these pseudoscientific fields as we currently understand them came about in the 1800s, but the roots of naturopathy go back to folk medicines in antiquity. Naturopathy claims its roots in the medicine of Hippocrates, but the idea of using roots and teas to kill pain and reduce swelling and fevers goes back considerably further. Homeopathy was the brainchild of one Samuel Hahnemann who after giving himself a major overdose of quinine came down with shakes and fever. He then jumped to the highly dubious conclusion that these were the symptoms of malaria, followed by the crushingly bad leap of a logic that if the cure causes the disease, then vanishingly small amounts of the curative would have a stronger effect on the real thing. So vanishingly small, that the substance would have to be diluted in water to such an extreme degree that one would be hard pressed to find any of the original ingredients. The way they get around that is to tell people that water has an extended molecular memory, and they have some magic that enables them to teach water what they want it to know. Because, you know, water has to worry about final exams. Somehow. I know what finals are like, and water won't do well. It is two hydrogen atoms with one of oxygen. No brain. You can't even make a brain with that. In training, the homeopath learns to shake the water in a special way and then evaporate most of it away, freeing well-trained water molecules to go about their business? If they're that good at studying, why not use them all? You could use them to help even more water to study, like an army of tiny tutors. Take one treated test tube, pour the contents into nine additional test tubes, leaving some water in the original tube, add more water, give it a special shake. You have a tenfold increase in profit. Okay, maybe I am a bit silly here and they don't do it that way because reasons. I have no idea what they might be, but then, I'm a history student, not a homeopath. Either way, by the time you've done the needed 30 to 50 dilutions on a single cubic centimeter of whatever substance you started with, all the little vials you've got have effectively none of the original material left. What's saddest about this entire thing is that they think that it's now vastly more potent as a curative for whatever the problem might have been. Not that they'd really know, their testing method uses healthy people, and attempts to make them ill. Let's say I have a magic substance that will sound spiffy if I slap the homeopathic label on it. We will call it baby venom. The trial process for it is to give a quantity of the jewel from a teething human infant to people, without telling them what it is, of course, and then have them self-report any symptoms they might have over the next several weeks or months. We have a group of a hundred split evenly male and female. Half the women get pregnant, the other half along with half the men complain of headaches and depression, and one of them dies. Of the pregnant, maybe a third have out of control pregnancy symptoms, and another unfortunate sap that likes to naked skiing with his girlfriend gets frostbite on his testicles, followed by gangrene. Sounds pretty severe, doesn't it? If I were anyone but a homeopath or a naturopath, I would end the trials on the spot. Of course, there would be a control group, complete physicals for all the participants, and earlier trials indicating what it might be good for. The homeopath will giggle a lot, and start preparing it for market as a contraceptive that's good against depression, life extension, headaches, and frostbite. Ladies already pregnant should still take it, 
because it will keep their hormones from being crazy. How is this? To the homeo quack, like cures like. If it causes a problem, a whole lot less of it will fix it right up. Logic, right? Well, no. Not so much. There's no rational basis from which this might even be considered valid reasoning. Everything we've learned about the human body or the way medicine works on it suggests that Hahnemann cooked his brains during his experiment with that bark he made a meal out of. Of course, this is where homeopathy's kissing cousin connects to it. Naturopathy has the same sorts of issues, covered in part by the mysticism of the Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese. It makes outrageous claims on the flimsiest evidence. The primary difference between the two is that you're actually getting the substance that you're supposed to be. It focuses on disease prevention by means of nutrition, botanical cures, homeopathic medicine, acupuncture, and other similar devices. They see themselves as removers of barriers to health, and letting the body heal itself. That sounds familiar somehow. Where did I see that? Oh, right. The homeopaths claim that all illness stems from derangement of the vital force's normal harmonious vibratory frequency. I begin to see where spirit science gets his material. I'll leave a link in the kawaii bar for your laughs. Hanman went on to build an entire science surrounding his quackery, and spread it over a large part of the world. Of course, in the 19th century, science-based medicine was largely hit or miss, and so the homeopathic patient typically had somewhat better outcomes than the people that relied on traditional medicine. This isn't because homeopathy works, but because it doesn't. Taking on water generally doesn't cause issues for patients of most diseases, and so if the patient's immune system was up to the task, they got better. If not, then not. Proper medicine was in its infancy, and so treatments would sometimes be dangerous, and have poor efficacy rates. Medicine as it's practiced today has far fewer issues, whereas homeopathy and naturopathy haven't seen any significant advances in the last century and a half. We also have the ability to test their cures in properly designed studies, and they've invariably found results similar to placebo. Now, back to naturopathy, which has all manner of cures for whatever ails you, assuming you have the money. Most states refuse to license them, and even so, one must have a small group of prerequisites to get in. The list is rather short, and if you've the right mindset you can get them while at a community college in a year or maybe two without obtaining an actual degree. This is considerably better than the super rigorous training to be a homeopath, but it still falls short of what it takes to become a proper doctor. Most of that time is spent studying nutrition, strangely enough. You'll also learn about herbs, spices, and homeopathy, alongside such heady and exciting things like massage therapy, acupuncture, Chinese remedies business, and so forth. There is some study of the human body, but most of it is overview material without getting deep into biology or anatomy and physiology. They take the same time, four years in school, but that's where the similarities end. I find it telling that clinical hours are restricted to the four-year training cycle, whereas an MD needs three more years of residency before they are considered qualified to take the exams for a license. The board that accredits naturopathy schools requires a total of 1200 clock hours to graduate, with more than 800 in a primary or secondary care role. In this time, they have to have a minimum of 450 patient interactions, half of which are in the primary care role. If the clinic is as busy as most family practice offices, you can get up to 25 a day, thus you could in theory make the minimum requirements in less than a month. 15 weeks of clinical training overall including preceptorship, which as I'm given to understand it is mentor time that each student is required to have. That's right, they get to see patients as naturopathic doctors before they've even gotten all their coursework done. An MD will spend all of their time in medical school observing, and then spend three more years of their lives working as doctors under the supervision of another doctor whose job it is to make sure they don't fuck up. Additional fun is had when you attempt to look up course descriptions or syllabi for any of the classes that a college of naturopathy teaches, or try to get a list of whom is teaching what. You're not going to find anything comprehensive in course descriptions, and no syllabi posted. There's no way to know what you're going to be taught before you show up for class the first day, and even then you might not find out. Enter a proper medical school, it's easy to figure out who is on staff, 
as well as course descriptions and syllabus for each is generally available to the public for the asking. Or if you want to work for it, a few clicks of the mouse. In point of fact, a large number of schools go to some lengths to describe exactly what is going to happen in each step of the process. What do we get from the naturopathy schools? In those places where they are considered primary care providers, there's even a licensing test called Implex that the naturopaths swear is rigorous, but given what I've seen from more than a few of them over the years, I don't believe it. Not when presented with some of the literature coming out of the local naturopathy association. Some of it is merely diluted, other bits are outright dangerous. Injecting hydrochloric acid into the veins of a patient is a sheer way to create more problems than the one you're trying to solve. In fact, I'm not entirely sure what problem you even could solve by doing that. Similarly, trying to balance one's blood pressure and body temperature at the same numerical values is a lovely way to kill a patient. I don't have a source for the second other than a single patient under the care of a naturopath local to Kage. However, I have seen the prescription for 100 to 1 dilution of water and hydrochloric acid. The naturopath had a non-scary name attached to it, of course. They do similar things with hydrogen peroxide, as well. Most will shy away from prescribing real drugs, but then their training doesn't have the one thing they would need to even be qualified to do so, pharmacology. The average naturopath and practice won't have seen a single truly sick person during their limited training cycle, but any MD will have. They will, on the other hand, prescribe a toxic cousin of the everyday cared for a cough, and treat various other ills with megadoses of vitamins. Never mind that a hundred times the recommended daily allowance of vitamin C will do mean things to your kidneys if you keep it up long enough, or that using lead for chelation will lead to a myriad of other problems. Just ask the Roman Empire, which used lead to line the aqueducts that fed the city. That creatures like this are then launched into the world ready to hang out a shingle and start making money by deceiving the gullible and the exceedingly old-fashioned is nauseating, to say the least. Anti-vaccine proponents will adore them, however, as the vast majority are entirely against dispensing real medications to deal with real problems. No vaccines for little Iko. And when she contracts measles and whooping cough all at one go, they have a 30 seed dilution of baby venom waiting on the shelf, in convenient cherry flavored syrup or sugar pill form. There have been any number of people out there selling cancer cures in the form of fresh vegetables or juice, overwhelming doses of vitamins and minerals, and special homeopathic remedies that not only cured the cancer they never had, but will clean up the metal toxicity that's causing your autism symptoms. The claims are outrageous the science weak or non-existent, and the cures are ineffective or outright toxic. The best part is, like the average creationist, they use the legislation and the courts to spread their quackery, rather than do what real medicine did, and prove itself safe and efficient using the scientific method. If nothing else raises a red flag around here, that should. I will put links to my sources in the kawaii bar for the odd skeptic that wants a look. Yes, one of them is a blog but it has been a long-running thing largely written by medical professionals whose credentials can be checked, and they cite verifiable sources. Last, but not least, please keep the comments section in English. Even if I can read what you had to say, very few others can, and that restricts everyone's ability to join in the discussion. If you post in Japanese, I will not answer. Continue to do so, and your comments will be deleted. I will ask you to be courteous and at least conform to the norms for the channel. If you watched the video, please subscribe, rate, and comment. It doesn't matter if you liked it or not, or think I misrepresented things. In fact, if you think I'm wrong, then please do comment with your evidence. I promise to at least look it up, and issue a retraction if I have made a mistake that can be substan. Chi aided. Until next time. <laughs>